All you political junkies out there, you know who you are. <laughs> Probably think that if I mention Carville and Louisiana in the same sentence, I'd be talking about that strategist who has engineered so many successful Democratic campaigns, James Carville. But long before any of us heard of him, his hometown, Carville, Louisiana, had quite the reputation. Since the days of his great-grandparents, it was infamous, notorious, because a leper colony was established there in 1894. Folks who had Hansen's disease were sent there up until 1999. The founders of the colony lied about their mission because they were afraid local opponents would resort to violence. They said they were buying that 350 acres near the Mississippi River for a farm. They brought the first patients in by night on coal barges. And Hansen's disease continued to inspire that kind of terror and hatred in the early 20th century, many states still had laws that let sheriffs arrest and confine anyone they thought might have leprosy. Over 4,500 people were confined at Carville over the years. Today, Carville is a museum filled, as Susan Larson wrote, with the haunting remnants of a closed world where residents who came or were brought by force often surrendered their given names upon admission for fear of shame for their families. In the graveyard at Carville, many lie under headstones carved with pseudonyms, their so-called Carville names. They'd include their real patient numbers on the tombstones just in case later generations might come looking for them. One resident described how his family and friends abandoned him after his diagnosis. No one wants to know about you or think about you, he said. You are forgotten, and that's a feeling you never forget. Patients with Hansen suffered disfiguring skin lesions. Many lost the use of toes and fingers or even limbs as their cartilage deteriorated and they needed amputations. Some became paralyzed or blind. In 1941, a therapy was finally developed that could render Hansen's non-contagious. And today, it can usually be cured with antibiotics. But throughout most of history, people who had leprosy were in a hopeless situation. In New Testament times, people with leprosy were sent out away from populated areas to live. If anyone approached, they were supposed to cry out, unclean, so that passersby didn't accidentally get contaminated and become pariahs too. In today's reading, Jesus encountered one of those folks who had been given the heave-ho out of town. The man was supposed to avoid healthy people not run up to them and beg for favors. Poor Jesus, however will he handle this scandalous event? <laughs> well, my husband, Jim, was a campus minister. He developed a powerful ministry with persons living with HIV and AIDS. Recall that AIDS was not diagnosed in this country before the early 1980s. And throughout the 80s and the first half of the 90s, Jim worked with so many people who discovered they were positive at a time when HIV was still a death sentence and a quick one. And in ultra-conservative North Louisiana, well, maybe you can imagine how a person with AIDS was regarded. I remember our being at John's house around 2 in the morning when he was clearly going to die within the hour. And while Jim talked with a family member, John's partner, who was also infected but not sick yet, stood on one side of John's bed, and I stood on the other side holding his hand. John looked up at me, and though he could barely speak, he managed to ask me, will I be with God? It was no wonder he still had doubts, despite all Jim's work with him, because so many people 
had told John where he deserved to be instead of with God. His own mother would not come to his funeral. And reading through the lens that this ministry was providing him, Jim saw this story about Jesus quite differently than he had seen it before. The point of the story was not that Jim, that Jesus, you're you're very powerful, dude. (laughs) The point of the story was not that Jesus healed a man with leprosy, but that he did so by touching him. Now, there are other stories where Jesus' abilities made him so popular that he's pursued by crowds of admirers to the point that he doesn't even have time to eat. I've seen today's story interpreted as though the reason he couldn't go into towns anymore was because he'd get mobbed by adoring fans. Jim's new lens revealed that once word spread that he touched a leper, Jesus couldn't go into towns because he too was considered to be infected. Jesus, too, has become a leper. He sends the man to a priest for the ritual cleansing that will restore him to his community and his community to him. But the story contains no indication that Jesus went for the cleansing. Most English translations of today's text, like the one that Nancy read, indicate that when the man says, if you are willing, you can heal me, Jesus was moved with pity or with compassion. When I took Greek, I learned that the word is actually anger. Jesus was moved with anger. The common English Bible says incensed, Jesus reached out his hand. About a footnote acknowledges that compassion is more commonly used. The translators whose work I grew up with must have thought anger was an error. Surely Jesus wouldn't have been angry at this poor, afflicted man who needs him. They've chosen pity or compassion because, after all, pity and compassion are just so much more, how should we say it, so much more Jesus-like. It's been a problem for commentators, too, When they acknowledge the anger thing, they're quick to explain that Jesus wasn't really mad at the man. No, Jesus was angry at the affliction itself. He hates the leprosy, not the leper. Or some maintain he was angry at the forces of evil which made the man sick. Reading through gems and through my lived experience, I must say that these all seem like inadequate explanations. I suggest he was furious at the customs and rules that made this man an outcast. If you are an outcast, it's because somebody cast you out. I think Jesus was angry that society had ostracized the man, isolated him, deemed him unclean, shamed him. I think he was angry at the kind of rules that resulted in all those white tombstones at Carville marked with a number. And consider this, Jesus didn't have to touch the man. There are stories where he heals people without touching them. In the same Gospel of Mark, there's the story of the Syrophoenician woman whose daughter he heals from a distance. He doesn't even see her, it's just calm. Your daughter is well. So why then does he touch this man, knowing full well it's going to change his own status unless he goes to a priest for cleansing, knowing that it will put him in solidarity with people deemed lepers? He chooses to carry this stigma forward. Being in solidarity with outcasts does not come cheap. It is not easy or convenient. Sometimes it takes getting angry. Soon after the first patients were sent to Carville, four members of the Sisters of Charity Order arrived to care for them. Throughout the 20th century, sisters lived there among the outcasts. Their work mattered tremendously. James Carville wrote the foreword to a book about the facility's history. He said, 
Through the gates of Carville came ravaged and diseased bodies, broken spirits, people stripped of all dignity and hope. A lot of them had been subjected to the most vile and worst forms of humiliation, degradation, and outright stupidity that a society can heap on people it fears and things it doesn't understand. But once inside those gates, people began to gain strength, to find dignity and hope, and in many cases, love. Much of that love came from the sisters. For at least one of them, though, providing tender, loving care was not enough. Sister Hilary Ross became a biochemist and worked on the search for more effective treatment. She wanted a cure, not just relief for symptoms. It makes me think of the words of Dr. King about the Good Samaritan who stopped on the road to Jericho to provide help to the man lying beside the road. Providing that kind of help was good, he said, but he added, one day we must come to see that the whole Jericho road must be transformed so that the men and women will not be constantly beaten and robbed as they make their journey. Or put in terms we learn in seminary, charity will take us just so far. Then we begin to have to seek justice. So how do we respond when we see people cast out because they have something we're afraid we'll catch, like a disease, like poverty, or oppression from cartels or from their own governments? What do we do when a person, a child in a cage, when a thousand children in cages are ostracized because they aren't fit to become part of our society? If you're our graduates, Reverend Laurie Walkie and Reverend Chris Moore, you go to the border to keep vigil, to pray, to stand witness. If you're unable to go to the border, you speak up where you are. Has it changed the immigration policies of this administration? Not yet. But as Walter Wink wrote, waving holy water and a crucifix over Buchenwald would scarcely have stopped the Nazi genocide of Jews. But think about it. What if the church in Germany had staged ritual acts of protest outside those gates? Who is outcast and calling for healing in your world? For Greta Thunberg, it's those most affected by climate change. And in this country, that's usually poor women and children and people in racial or ethnic minorities. Next month, I'll take students to New Orleans to study the churches after Katrina, speaking of climate change. A few years after landfall, a regional minister talked to my class about the struggle to get congregations to take this unprecedented opportunity to reach out to the community in ways that they had not ever done before. But he said, they tell me, these are not our people. I say, yes, but they're God's people. When Jesus encountered the man with leprosy, it was clear that the good moral folk in charge of things did not consider people with this disease to be their people. Jesus, however, saw him as one of God's people. Following Jesus requires that we move ourselves out of our everyday lives. Touch, it goes both ways. It wasn't just a man with leprosy who was touched that day. Jesus was touched, too. And the text tells us it changed his life. It tells us when the man ignores Jesus' plea not to tell, Jesus couldn't enter towns. The audience for his teachings increase, but his personal freedom is severely limited by this act. Standing in solidarity does not come cheap. Being in solidarity with outcasts is not easy or convenient. 
moved with pity, moved by compassion, moved by anger, incensed, he reached out his hand. And we, we do what we can. And we do it where we are. We reach out our hands and touch. Touch.